Hello, so tonight I am joined by Alastair Sims. Hello, Alastair, thank you very much for, for joining me. No problem. Hello and welcome to, welcome to Yorkshire. Oh, thank you very much. Well, it's, yeah, that's, that's the thing. I can only go to, to Yorkshire virtually at the moment, but um, it's a place I have been to a few times and thoroughly enjoyed every time I've been there. So um, hopefully in the future, I'll be able to get back there again. <laughs> Pretty soon. <Hopefully. laughs> now, of course, Alistair, you're a, a master cooper and uh, which is a, a reason I, of course, want to speak to you, something that I find fascinating. Um, I was just mentioning to you a moment ago, I've got a, a little bit of history with uh, coopering in, in my family when I've done a bit of uh, family research. and that, So it's always held a bit of a fascination um, for me. But uh, for those that don't know much about uh, the, the job of a cooper or a master cooper, what, uh, what kind of projects and what kind of work is, do you do on a sort of daily basis or traditionally does a, does a cooper do? Uh, we, we had a make make brand new casts we remake which is cutting down to make them into smaller sizes which we've always traditionally done so we've always been sort of green and uh, we repair as well and we sell back i can be called upon I've, I've got an extra qualification i can make wooden wooden vats or wooden brewing vessels as well so sometimes we get called into other industries the side industry and that's repair the, the uh, wooden wooden vats that they have for aging cider. Oh, okay, so sorry. okay, great. So I guess, and, and does that also include distilleries and sort of washbacks and things like that, those huge kind of, uh, or is that I've, a little bit too I've, big? <laughs> I have got, I have got, no, I've, I've got to say they're not too big. I mean, some of the vats I've repaired on have been uh, eight metres high. But I've uh, always, want, I've always been jealous of the vat makers in Scotland doing the washbacks. I've always wanted to have a go at repairing Ooh. one or making, making one, but never had the chance. Well, I mean, you may, uh, this is what we're going to talk about a little bit later. You may have the chance in the future, I guess, because we're seeing an English whiskey boom at the moment. So there might be a, a knock on your door or, or a phone call very shortly, I, I should imagine. Um, but before we get into chatting about um, you know, your, your work at the moment and, and English whiskey and that kind of thing, um, just give us a little bit of background. You know, how did you become a cooper? Um, is it something that's uh, always run in your family for, for, for generations or were you the first? And, and how did you get into it? And what's the, what does the training involve? Uh, I'm first to be a cooper, but I'm fourth generation brewery worker. Uh, and it was a school holiday job that at the local brewery, just sweeping up the yards and making sure that Newcastle Brown Hill cases had our white bottles in and no brown bottles. Yeah. I've been there for, when I was 14, I've been there for about a fortnight. And they came and said the Cooper wanted, and I didn't know what Cooper was. And they took me up and introduced me to the Cooper and I had to take, they just bought some barrels from a brewery in Nottinghamshire. I had to take the old name out and put, put feet and mass them into them and give them a coat of paint and soak them up before they were used. And uh, I like woodwork, and I kept watching him between branding the barrels and shot away when he when he turned around to look, and then one day he caught me looking and just said, "You want to have a go?" And as I say, after that, the rest is history. But it's wow. it's a four and a half year apprenticeship. It's hard. I mean, I don't know why anybody would want to do it, but yeah, it's, I mean, I make it look easy, but it isn't. It's it's hard work, and it's just you know you've got. To, You've got to learn two, there's about two and a half thousand joints for each size of cask and there's six standard brewery beer casks and then you've got all the spirit casks on top of that. So it's it's them working with that to work with them to make sure you yeah. get it all right. And that's that's a, that's a skill you've got to get. And while you're doing the one job, you've got to be thinking about three jobs ahead as well. My goodness. So, you, yeah, so you're, you're, if you're... If you're jointing the stage, you've got to think about the cask of when it's raised and bent, what it looks like as you're jointing it. So, yeah, keeps on your Gosh. toes. So you've got to be pretty good with your, pretty good with your hands. Of, oh, pretty good with your hands, of course, but also, I guess, mentally, you're doing a lot of calculations and, you know, you're always, as you say, you're always going to be sort of three steps ahead. So it's a pretty... So yeah. once, you, once you did your four-year-and-a-half-year apprenticeship, um, and then, I, as I understand it, you become, is it like a journeyman, Cooper, and then after so long in your career, once you um, once you start training apprentices yourself and have successfully trained one, then is that is that when you become a master Cooper from, from that point on? Yeah, you, yeah. so I did four and a half years as an apprentice, and you become a journeyman, and that goes back to the Norman French, meaning to travel around, because Coopers were right up until 
sort of fit, late fifties, early sixties was were all self-employed because the vast majority of peace work. A lot still were in Scot, or still are in Scotland because they get paid for what they do. Uh, and then after you, you can take an apprentice at any time you want. So you can be twelve months out of your time. And you can have an apprentice. Okay. Once you have an apprentice, once he successfully comes out of his time, you can assume the title of master. It's a little bit different in Scotland. The master's the person that owns the cooperage. So oh, the okay. coopers only stop as journeymen, whether uh, they've had apprentices or not. Uh, I see. So it's, so it's, it's just a little bit different. Uh, well, and, and so you've, you know, you, you're obviously, a, you're, a, you're a master cooper yourself and have been for some years now. And, um, and I remember there was a, so in the in the news, you know, a few years ago, there was a piece about you, and I think you appeared on on like BBC News and the ten o'clock news and things like that. When there was a search on for you, as at that time you were the last master cooper in England, um, and you were looking for an apprentice. You know, how did that go? Did you find your apprentice, and and uh, how was the search? Yeah, we, we we got an apprentice, and eighteen months into it, he jacked it in because he said it was too hard to work. Oh gosh. <laughs> Wow. So, uh, okay. So, uh, and I guess with the things that are happening now in, in English whiskey and this kind of growing, you know, growing, emerging English whiskey scene that we're seeing that, 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 that young man probably gave up a, a, pretty, a pretty decent opportunity, but he's quite busy right now. <laughs> so gave, how does it stand now? Opportunity. Oh gosh. Well, and how does it stand now? Are, are you, um, are you, are you still the only, that you still the last uh, master cooper in England or uh, have we got some oh, others this, that have, there's two more of these, and believe it or not, we're all in North Yorkshire. <laughs> oh, basically, okay. Fun. Wow, so there must be something about it. Is, is, it is, is Yorkshire and North Yorkshire a, a traditional heart for, for coopering? <laughs> or cooper it looks like it's at the moment. It's where <laughs> most of us are. <laughs> well, that's it. So it's, it's, Yorkshire can claim to have the best coopers in England. That's <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Dogs on county, what more do you expect? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, um, no, it's it's just it's just funny. It's just it's just how it's happened. That uh, the last the last two breweries in 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 England on wooden casks just happened to be based in North Yorkshire. Oh, cool. With Feetsons and, and Samuel Smiths. Samuel Smith. Yeah, I'm a big fan of lots yeah. of things that come out of Samuel Smith's actually. So is that how, when you started your career um, as a cooper or as a journeyman, were you mainly working within the brewing industry? So in, in, yeah, in brewing? Yeah, I started for Tin and Eastern and then went through the, all the takeovers of the Matthew Browns and Scottish Newcastle. I left and then went to work for Wadworths in Devizes in Wiltshire. Uh, it was while working for Wadworths because I got they had a lot of pubs where the beer was up behind the bar, but it was only a limited number of casks that there were actually beer was going out in. Mm. So it gave me an opportunity to hone my commercial skills and do what I wanted to do, do whiskey barrels and do gin casks and just, and I got this vat making qualification. So when, when the two big cider companies, the one in Herefordshire and, and the one in Somerset, yeah. That both have wooden vats for cider wanted them repairing. It was it was a way to get back into, you know, just holding my, my vat making skills as well and getting getting them back to where they should be. Fantastic. So, yeah. So, and how does how does what are the main differences between sort of making and repairing and building casks? You know, in the in the brewing industry with beer compared to like spirits industry and something like whiskey. You know, how do what's the sort of different disciplines and, and sort of uh, techniques that are employed in each? With brewery casks, everything inside's got to be perfectly level, so you can't have any lumps and bumps because obviously that you get your yeast and your hops stuck to it with it being traditional beer. Yeah. Where the spirit casts, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if one stays thicker than another. And beer casts just by nature, because they've got to take, you know, the pressure of secondary fermentation, and they've got to be delivered in and out all the time. They are a little bit more robustly made than a spirit cask. Not saying that spirit casts are, you know, no greater or no less of a build, but they don't have to take the pressures. And once they're filled, they're just rolled into a store. Or a lot, lot now we just stand them on pallets and fill them through the head, so they're palleted in in stars, you know. So yeah, it's, it's 
the two different skills in the two disciplines, when you're making beer casks, you get a tolerance of, if it's a 36 gallon cask, a 36 gallon two pints to 36 gallon four pints. And they can't be any, any smaller or any bigger. Whereas if you're making a 40 gallon whiskey cask, you're allowed a gallon either way. So it's, you know, it's not, it's not so tight. So you can chuck them up a little bit faster and whereas beer casks slow you down. Let's say a bit, a bit, I like beer casks because it's more intricate work. But yeah. over the last sort of five, six years, I've been doing more spirit casks. Okay. And I find spirit casks, uh, they don't tax me as much. <laughs> You can just, you know, you can you can put Planet Rock on and sing your head off and just rattle them out. Whereas beer cast now, when I go back to beer cast, I've got to, I've got to put my thinking cap on. Uh, okay, that's interesting. It keeps you sharp. <laughs> yeah. No. So compared to say say if you, let's go back just like a few years ago. So of course, when it comes to English whiskey and things like that, you got the first English whiskey distilleries, you know, popping up in two thousand and six with you know St George's and the English Whiskey Company. So back then, um, I guess you were was it you primarily working in you know the brewing and like beer casks and that kind of thing and the odd kind of spirit casks and things here and there. Have you seen? So like since that period and particularly in the last 10 years, have you yourself seen a massive increase in your workload towards spirits and particularly whiskey casks being made? Yeah, but it's it's for the it's for the smaller, smaller whiskey companies, the ones that are doing the want the uh, 55 litre and the 75 litre and the 100 litre casks that don't want the 200 litres. Okay. The 200 litre, you know, the bigger people like the, the English whiskey company. They seem to be going to Scotland for the 200 litre cast. They seem to bypass us. Oh, okay. When we when we could offer them a bit, probably a better service than they're getting in Scotland. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's uh, we'll have to flag that one up for them. <laughs> well, I'm surprised actually. Yeah, with with like the English whiskey company particularly, you know, you'd you'd think there'd be a little bit of a reach out to some uh, English coopers out there, which would be be quite nice, you know, in, in the spirit. Yeah, of I mean. Thing. You know, the thing is we could do we can do with the distilleries in England that they can't the Scots can't do is we can actually offer them bond services. So if, if they've got leaking casts in bond store, we, we'd actually be on we could actually be a phone call away for them. Because ah, it's not that far true. to travel around England wherever you go. Absolutely. So are you able to talk about some of the um the English whiskey distilleries that, that you're currently working for and some of the projects that uh, that you're working on with them? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Cooper King. Mm -hmm. We we do. I've made some casts for them, and we also do the repairing because they're buying different bourbon casts in from different from the uh, craft bourbon makers in America. So they're buying the, the smaller hundred liter casks in. So when they come in, I repair them, and I'm, I'm quite good. Quite get because they do a quick turnaround for Cooper King because they're on the doorstep. They're only forty minutes away. Yeah. Uh, Filey, Filey Bear, I've made some glass, I made a glass eddy cast for them and I've done some casts, made some little casts for them. Okay. We have talked about making new casts out of Yorkshire Oak. Fantastic. Well, because this is one thing that with this, I've got some spirit of Yorkshire and Filey Bay stuff here. And, and whereas all, a lot of the other um, English whiskey distilleries will put, you know, English, English single malt whiskey, that kind of thing, I love the fact that they put, Yorkshire single malt whiskey, which is uh, which is quite a very proud proud Yorkshire distillery, and why not? And and um, I was chatting to, to Billy Abbott from the Whiskey Exchange the other day, and he he said, well, you know, the English aren't seen as you know in such a favourable light sometimes abroad, you know, um, and I can imagine that being on a shelf in in the states or in Australia or somewhere, and you know, Yorkshire single malt, what's that? You know, it's uh, quite a cool. Uh, <laughs> I like the fact that they've gone for you know Yorkshire, Yorkshire single malt rather than English, which is which is quite interesting. Um, York, Yorkshire is a good name to sell, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so at the moment, because both of those distilleries that you've mentioned are in, um, are of course in Yorkshire, Cooper King and um, and Spirit of Yorkshire. Um, but I kind of, I suppose I heard, well, I remember hearing about you and, and your work, you know, when you were searching for The Apprentice a few years back. Um, but uh, then in recent conversations, I was chatting to, with Darren Rook um, from the London Distillery Company. Um, and I think he mentioned that, you know, you'd, you'd made a cask or a couple of casts for, for them back then. So have you, have you or are you working with any, car, uh, with any um, distilleries outside of Yorkshire? 
as well at the moment in, in English, specifically in English yeah. whiskey. No, we're not because I've I've just had uh, two years out of coopering because of oh, okay. circumstances beyond my control. Oh, okay. uh, we had to cease trading with the auction, with the White Rose Cooperage, so I had to take a proper I had to take a proper job to pay some debt off. So I've been working oh, as a as, as a second train job I had worked by working for things because I've been working for as a drayman for Black Sheep Brewery. Ah, interesting. I so, didn't realize uh, that. Actually, I've just, yeah. yeah, I've just uh, well, this is a, this is the first week I've I've been there. I've actually now working for a company called Jensen's Cooperage, Jensen. which oh, if you okay. look up, if you look it up, it's actually uh, based in London, but the Cooperage is actually here in Ripon in North Yorkshire. And oh. the idea is, is to start offering services to whiskey distillers and whatever else we've got in England as, Fantastic. as an English so company. Got, so I've got a bit of an exclusive here. This is a, you have. <laughs> an English. Fantastic. Well, I, I really appreciate you um, sharing that information. So it's Jensen. Is that, is that like, how, how is that spelled? Like J-E-N-S-E-N? Yeah, or? It's, yeah J-E-N-S-E-N, yes. Proper Danish oh. way. It's well, actually... Maybe our, the parent company, if you look, parent company up, Bermondsey Gin. Oh, interesting. Okay, very interesting. So, well, well maybe you'll have to set me up with with um, some further interviews there because I'd love to um, hear all about that. You know, especially if they're kind of headquarters or whatever is, is based down here in London. Very, I'm I'm in in, in East London, so um, that's that's very interesting. So, well, great, you've given me an exclusive. So, I really appreciate that. So that's that's very exciting. So, so and and. That cooperage is going to, you know, be out there to help the demand for for English whiskey companies that, that are manufacturing whiskey now, and and um, that's that's quite exciting news actually, and the first time I've heard of that. So, uh, do you know what any more of the plans are for the company, and and um, is it still quite, so? It's got a parent company, but is it still quite a young company um, itself? It's yeah, we're we're very, we're very young, we're brand new. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, the the idea is 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 to make we'll still do bit casts for beer work and all that, but it's to pick up some spirit work with uh, either repairing, making new ones, remaking the two hundred liters into smaller casts for the smaller ones, and we've even, we've even can we're setting up so we can make new, and we've got well at the moment I've got contacts for Staffordshire Oak. Or Herefordshire, Welsh border oak, wow. and I've got to go and work on the Yorkshire oak one. But I think we'll leave the Yorkshire oak for the time being. But they're they're two nice variants on the oak, and the, and well, they've both got different flavours. Uh, well, well, this is something very interesting actually, and that I wanted to move on to as well and, and talk about because we and I've talked about this a lot, and people are going to get bored of me talking about this. Um, but the differences between English whiskey and Scotch and Irish and American is that at the moment, as as the, the, the law stands, you know, the English whiskey companies have been following European law. Um, but of course, we have Brexit and all that. So, so it's leaving going to leave things a little bit more wide open um, as to what is going to define an English whiskey. And of course, those companies have got the freedom to experiment with different casks at the moment that Scotland, you know, doesn't doesn't have that freedom. I think some things have slightly changed up in Scotland, but in terms of, you know, outside of oak and things like that, you know, English whiskies can 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 go into that sort of area of experimentation. So in your experience, how does, um, let's say, for example, American oak um, or European oak, um, how does it compare to English oak? You know, is it a very different wood to be working with, and does it cause you challenges? And you know, what are the main differences between you know between, between different oak varieties? American oak's like using steel. <laughs> uh, is it? No. Yeah, it is. It's, it's it's actually not as bad as a Spanish oak. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, American oak's it's a lot harder to use. It's a lot harder to work. Uh, the difference is, if you said American oak was like old-fashioned butter that comes straight out of the fridge where you had to get a proper sharp <laughs> knife to take it off before you spread it on your toast. The the, the English and European oak's a bit more like the the, uh, the spreadable butter. They're a bit easier to work. I say, with the exception of the Spanish oak, that's a, that's that's even worse than the American oak. That's very but, interesting. Uh, yeah, and they all and they all give different flavors, so it depends what you want as well. And so, how would you describe? So, um, 
that, that's an interesting point as well. So, like, say with um, you mentioned there, Yorkshire oak or Staffordshire oak, and you know things like that. So, in your experience, what are the differences between the kind of potential flavour profiles with using regional variations in within England for, for oak? Uh, English oak gives you on on the, on the liquid, it'll give you what they call a green apple flavour. Mm -hmm. And it's just one's a little bit more pronounced than the other, and it's quite funny how it works. I think it's to do with climate in the in the different regions. Yeah. But then again, if you go to, if you go and use the the French sessile oak from the Allier region of France, which is bang in the middle, that gives you whatever you put in it. It gives you that nice dry Chardonnay flavour to it feel. So, and we know that out of with the six X, when I worked for Wadworths, we did English York, which had the six X to give it a nice green apple after flavour. Yeah. And the the, uh, the sessile oak from the France just actually completely dried it off and just give it that total Chardonnay flavour, which was quite nice actually. Because yeah. <laughs> I like I like I don't like sweet beers, so for me, it took the sweetness of the of the six X beer off, and it. But the other thing that oak does it takes all the nastiness out of it. So when you're trying to new mix and you get all that sharp, nasty, burny feel, yeah. when it goes into the oak, the oak takes all that out and matures it and softs it and brings the proper flavours of the, of the whiskey or the beer or cider, whatever you're putting into it, it brings that nice mellow flavour. So you get a, a fuller flavour. So you get a fuller mouth feel. So you can drink front to back and probably towards the back it'll give you them nice vanillas and all the other bits of cut that come out of the oak and then the, it depends the other thing that dif, dif, dif puts the flavour into whiskey is the char so it depends what char you have on it so yeah. you, you know you, whether you have a light char a heavy char or something in between the, you mentioned the London Exchange before the cast I did for them well actually I made them for an Irish lad that was going to cast age gin Oh, okay. Which yes. had never been so, done at the time. Yeah. And I'd never heard of Jim being cascaged. Yeah. And then I got told oh. off. Because oh, really? <laughs> it, was, it was all the people who remember a gin called Boobs, where you go <laughs> and everything's clear. Boobs had a yellow tinge to it. Uh -huh. Because it was all caged. Oh, I see. So they were they were trying to bring that. And that was, was that the London Distillery Company? Um I can't mention yeah, that. it was I can't remember the Irish lad, but he, he bought the barrels and then sold them on. So oh, okay. with wine, you get all these different toastings. So you get to a grand cru, which is just like turning the turning your black. Mm -hmm. And then the light char on a whiskey cask for the gin barrels, you've got to get it bob on him right in the middle. So the cask the English the, the London Exchange had were actually they put whiskey into them. I said they had very good results, but it wasn't a whiskey char in it. It was a gin char. <laughs> oh well, you know, but this is the great thing, isn't it? There's, there's um, sometimes, uh, you know, something that was meant for one thing it ends up being a slight mistake, but actually turns out better than the probably the original idea. You know, so it's quite an it, yeah. experimentation and that kind of playing around. Which, see, which in America now, we're just going for, you know, the more char you can get, the better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it might not be. I mean, it's it's. I, th I think if you're an English English whiskey company starting and yet you're wanting to work age, I think the best thing to do would be get some. I don't know it ages faster because it's a smaller ratio and you got more timber to to liquid volume. At least to buy some twenty liters and have them have, to, have them at different chars levels, so you taste them all against one another and then you decide yourself which char level you have. I mean, I'm a big believer in what the winemakers do. They actually tell the coopers and the cooperage what toast they want on the wine barrels. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the winemaker, the winemaker's got it in his head what his, his wine should taste like at the end of it after it's been all caged. So he'll tell you what, jet, what you know, what toast he wants in the barrel. Uh -huh. Now, I'm, I'm a big believer that, whis you know, the whiskey companies should get a bit more like that and actually you know, the whiskey blender should actually know what he wants or what oak he wants into that. Even if he doesn't know what char he wants, if he tells the cooper what he wants, I can, that's what I do with the, the wine people is 
they tell me what flavour they want and then I can skip it round in my own mind and decide what toast it's going to have. Wow, that's fun. That's that's really fascinating, actually. So I, I think some, um, you know, maybe after watching this and some more English whiskey distilleries could probably get in touch with you because that, that's the pretty kind of magic person that, that, that they'd be wanting. Um, talking about that like, different woods and, and the behaviours and that kind of thing. So, of course, oak is is one of the main, you know, main woods for casks. But what about other different types of woods? So I've heard of people playing around with chestnut and things like that. Are, are there any other woods, you know, varieties out there that you think could work particularly good for, for whiskey? I don't know. <laughs> I, I say <laughs> it all, I've, I'll try anything. I'll, you know, a lot of timbers don't bend. Mm -hmm. I mean, ash bends, but it, I don't know what flavour you get out of what ash. But it, yeah. I, I think it needs some clever person that's making the whiskey to decide what flavour they want and what they want to try. I mean, yeah. you know, if you want, if you want to try maple or you want to try <coughs> ash or you want to try, I mean, pine won't bend, but West, if you get some clear white Western cedar, that bends. Yeah. And I know, okay. I know in the fifties when it tried bending English chestnut, it didn't bend. I don't, Bass tried that. Because we're about, getting um, short of oak. What about you? I don't know. Probably, but it probably would bend. Yeah, but, so, uh, the, the yeah, bows were made out of that, out of you, weren't they? The, the bows and the long bows and things like that. Yeah. That might be an interesting one. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's it's. It, it, I, I, I'm not an advocate of saying yeah, you should try this, you should try that. I'm a believer that the person that make that's making it. It's like with the small, small microbrewers when they come to you and say, we want a wooden cask. What do you want a wooden cask for? Because we think it will look good. Or what do you want a wooden cask for? What do you mean? What do you want your wooden cask to do for your beer? Well, we've not thought about that. And I'll say, go away, think about it, and then come back and tell me if you still want one. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a believer that the person that's making the product should have it in his mind what he wants at the end of it. And then I'll just, if I can, I'll just have a go at making it. Oh, fantastic. And so with this new company that um, that's just been set up that, that you're working for, the, the Jensen uh, Cooperage. So what's going to be your role there? Are you going to be like one of the head cooper or the, the, the head cooper there? Or what's what's your what's your role going to be? Like? Uh, yeah, I'm head cooper or cooperage manager without without the paperwork. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's my, my idea It's for me to get it up and running. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, is we go along is to have is to either employ other coopers or take apprentices on and grow the business by having some apprentices at some time in the future. Well, we, we had this I had this conversation I, I, just before we started recording this. I, I mentioned it to you um, that I'd had this conversation um, with and I, I can't remember who was saying it, but it was saying, you know, if there was a, an English cooperage now that just set up with the right contacts and the right people working that really got in with all that's going on in English whiskey and English gin and all these kind of things that it, they're going to do exceptionally well and it'd be a great thing. So it, it seems that uh, that's all kind of lining up now so and, and someone like yourself who is already well known um amongst the industry and and of, of a huge amount of experience you know to have you heading up that team is going to be quite a, a very interesting thing so yeah i'm quite i'm quite excited about that actually i want to learn more about this company it sounds sounds very interesting i so, hope so am i excited yeah i bet but, I, I hope that um one when um, things settle down a bit from lockdown and all this kind of thing i'd love to then arrange to, to come uh, come up and, and view if that's possible to come and see you at yeah work you'd, be more and, than welcome. you'd be more than welcome but see my, my boss christian who owns bermondsey gin distillery mm -hmm. he knows a lot of these guys that are doing the whiskey people so he's Absolutely. got the road in already so oh, it's just hope he can go out and sell it now <laughs> well i think i think your name that is going to help sell that as well so your experience and your skills so i think that's that's not going to be a problem as, as far as i can see so i'm i'm i don't even run a distillery and i'm already quite excited about that news so i think there's going to be quite a few other other people there and i think you're going to have to so. maybe take a bit of rest now and um because i think you're going to be uh, rushed off your feet pretty soon <laughs> i know we like being rushed off our feet makes a day go quicker <laughs> absolutely so have you got any 
Um, we mentioned earlier about the, the apprentice that you had and you found and it didn't work out after 18 months or so. So are you going to be in that situation again now where you're going to be looking for, as you, you did say, that you're going to be looking for some other staff, but are you going to be on the search for an apprentice or apprentices? And, and maybe now with um, one thing that's come up a lot um, in discussions within the English whiskey world and, and in, in the wider English, you know, in the wider whiskey community is diversity and things like that. So, you know, might we see some, some female Coopers coming through, which would be quite an exciting thing. You might do. You don't know. <laughs> I mean, Jadjo, I've got got a couple of female coop, apprentice coopers at the moment. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. When when I had the White Rose Cooperage for for six months, I I employed an Australian female cooper. Oh, okay. uh, but yeah, there's 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 no reason why. But I'm not saying no. I'm not saying yes. It's it's just when the time comes and we apply for apprentices, all the candidates will be vetted, and the best one will get the job. Hopefully. Fantastic. Wow. <laughs> so and and so you you taken a couple of years out and uh, of of course kept your hand in and that kind of thing. Now you've got this exciting you know project to get stuck in with. So that's 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 fantastic. So how about yourself? Like you know now away from the whiskey, what what are your favorite? What kind of things do you do uh, to outside of making casks and repairing casks and, and being a master cooper? What kind of things do you uh, are you a whiskey fan yourself? Do you enjoy um, do you enjoy a single malt? I do. I, I drink. Uh, I drink spare. I like spare side malts because my mum comes from Grant on Spain and her brother used to work for Scottish Malt Distillers, so we weren't allowed to drink anything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do like spare sides. But uh, I hate to say this, and I shouldn't do really. But we got we go to whiskies, Jim Beam and Coke. Jim Beam and Coke. Unfortunately, yeah. oh, wow. <laughs> Unfortunately. you know what. There's, you know, I don't think I'm one of those people that um, that I believe that the best way to drink whiskey is the way that you like to drink whiskey, and that goes for anything. You know, um, there's, of course, there's a lot of snobbery around many things, and so oh, you shouldn't do this and should. But I, re I remember um, going to Lagavulin, and they were talking. About, I think it's called a Smoky Cokey, you know, where they have a Lagavulin 16 and Coke. You know, um, yeah. why not? <laughs> if, if that's the way you enjoy whiskey, if but, I mean, you know, or, you know, I mean, a nice a nice Scotch whiskey should be sat. I mean, it's getting time now for drinking Scotch whiskey. Dark Absolutely, nights, yeah. dark cold, wet nights, log fire. Yeah. Nice, nice glass of spare side malt. That's it. Warming up in the hand. <laughs> yeah. And how about English whiskey? Um, so I've got a few around here. Have you, you we mentioned uh, Spirit, excuse me, Spirit of Yorkshire and uh, Cooper King. Um, have you tried many English whiskies out there that you're now kind of making casks for? Have you tried any of their spirits and what are your impressions? No, I've got, I've got, uh, I've, the only one I've tried is a Cooper King new make, and, I, mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, uh, oh, uh, the new make from uh, Elsham World Distillery as well, and they're both, they're both nice. Yeah, okay. well, that's the thing, and I was, this is something that, that came up the other night as well, that I've not tried so much new make spirit, you know, in, in the last year i've tried more new make spirit than i have in say the last 10 years of, of being a whiskey sort of yeah. fan and, and collector and and i guess because the english whiskey distilleries they're so new um and they haven't of course it takes you know three years for, for their uh, spirits to become whiskey so a lot of distilleries are sending packs out for, for new make spirit and some maturing malts and you know so there's there's so much and and i, and I mentioned this uh to, to billy abbott from the the whiskey exchange as well and, and he was saying that he tried years ago you know to try and obtain new make spirit from the big scotch distilleries and it was very difficult to get them to part with any um, and now even the scotch whiskey distilleries are kind of bottling up and you know, doing new make releases and things like that as a special edition and things. So it's um, it's quite, but I think it's very interesting to to see the journey of some of the new make spirits. Like like you mentioned, Cooper King. I've tried a bit of their new make spirit as well, and, and agree is it, it's really really nice. And it was something that came up um, in some of the online tastings and things that I've been involved with. A lot of people really liking what they're doing and their style that they're coming from. So it'd be nice to to see how it. That's an opportunity that you get with English whiskey it's, is to try. It smells nice in the Bond house. Sorry, I, I said their Bond house smells very nice. I did some repairing in their Bond house a couple of months oh, ago. And that's oh, gorgeous. Uh, 
Yeah, oh, I bet it does. I would love to. I, I would love to go and you know all of these distilleries. Um, you know, I've been to quite a few, well. I've been to a few of the English whiskey distilleries, and I was planning on going to a lot more. You know, this year. Um, but of course, uh, with everything that's happened, um, I haven't made it that far yet. But um, hope I'm hoping to go and visit Cooper King and Spirit of Yorkshire. I was talking to recently, and so um, if all that happens, then I'll try and coordinate it at a time that I can then pop up and, and see you because you're up in Yorkshire as well. So that'd be uh, that'd be fantastic. So, um, well, thank you so much for, for joining me this evening. It's been really Thanks, fascinating pleasure. talking to you. And, and um, I'm so thrilled with this new Cooperage that's uh, that started up. And that, that's very exciting. And thank you for giving me a bit of a scoop on that. So um, I did it. You already mentioned that there. So that's not something I was I was aware of. So that's um, that's that's fantastic. So thank you very much for sharing that. And um, yeah, I really appreciate your, your time this evening. So thanks. Thanks so much for joining me. No, thank you very much for having me on your chat channel. Thank <laughs> you.